Good morning, everybody. Welcome uh, to another seminar by the Instituto de Astrofísica de Andalucía in Granada, in Spain. Today, <clears throat> we will have the, the talk by uh, Dr. Juan Carlos Gomez Martin. He will talk about the new developments at the IAEA Co Cosmic Dust uh, Laboratory. Juan Carlos studied physics in Granada, in Spain, and then uh, he took the PhD in atmospheric gas phase allogeny photochemistry, kinetics, and spectroscopy with Professor John Barrows at the Institute of Environmental Physics and Remote Sensing at the University of Bremen. In 2007, he was hired by Professor John Klein to carry out laboratory research on photochemistry and gas to particle conversion processes of mesospheric and tropospheric relevance at the School of Chemistry at the University of Leeds in, in, UK, in UK. In 2009, he moved to Toledo, Spain, where he worked with Alfonso Sainz Lopez at the Laboratory of Atmospheric and Climate Science at the SSIC. At Toledo, his uh, research focused on the design, construction, development, and field deployment of spectroscopy-based instruments for in-situ measurements of, of precursors, active and reservoir allogen species, with implication for tropospheric ozone destructions and new particle formation. In 2012, he moved back to Leeds to work with uh, Professor Plains, <clears throat> at the co cosmic dust in the terrestrial atmosphere, uh, which was a uh, ERC advanced grant. During this five-year project, he expanded the laboratory expertise on laser spectroscopy and mass spectrometry and performed spectroscopy, chemical kinetics, and phase change experiments relevant for the disintegration of meteoroids in planetary atmospheres and its impacts on atmospheric aerosols. Finally, in 2017, he was awarded with the Ramón y Cajal Fellowship, and he moved to Granada, Spain, to join the Instituto de Astrofísica de Andalucía, where he is now currently working on laboratory and remote spectrophotoporalimetric characterization of zodiacal, cometary, and asteroidal dust as well as of atmospheric terrestrial aerosols and Martian dust. Yes. So <clears throat> thank you very much, Juan Carlos, for uh, being here at the uh, seminars at the IAA. And uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, René, for the presentation. Uh, welcome, everyone, to this seminar. Um, so the idea of this seminar is uh, to give uh, an update of uh, what are we doing in the Cosmic Dust Laboratory here at the, at the Institute. Um, the, the talk is organized as follows. Uh, I will first start giving an overview of what, uh, of why is dust important in different uh, astro astrophysical environments. Then I will give uh, some uh, introduction to uh, the fundamentals of uh, dust scattering by dust particles and uh, about the Cosmic Dust Laboratory. Then I will go through the upgrades that we have uh, implemented over the last four years in the, in the laboratory. Uh, I will uh, schematically go through the research that we are undertaking now at, uh, at the Cosmic Dust Laboratory. And finally, I will uh, give a brief uh, up update on the Granada Amsterdam scattering database. So why, why do we study dust? We study dust because it's everywhere in the universe, both in atmospheric environments and in the, in the, in the interstellar medium, um, stellar envelopes, etc. Um, often detecting the light scattered by dust is the only way we have to actually see uh, objects uh, astronomically. Um, but be beyond that, uh, uh, because the scatter light uh, contains information about the characteristics of dust, which has scattered the light, if we analyze that light, then we can understand and uh, infer many properties about uh, what is the composition, the size, uh, uh, the structure of that dust. It also has a very important radiative uh, implication, uh, both in atmospheres and also in stellar envelopes. Actually, the formation and the distribution of dust in uh, stellar environments, uh, and also in atmospheres, is intertwined with uh, um, the, 
thermal structure and the composition of an atmosphere. That's why it's very interesting and very important actually to uh, go through uh, the composition, understanding the composition, distribution of size, et cetera. So as, uh, therefore, to do this, uh, this uh, modeling of atmospheric uh, environments and stellar environments, and to do the remote sensing, we need uh, to do experiment, uh, experiments in the lab in order to understand how particles uh, uh, leave their or encode the information in the light that they scatter. And that's what we do at Code Lab. Basically, we do uh, uh, experiments on lab, uh, dust scattering. I will go through this slide very quickly. Uh, as you know, the beam of, of light is described by the Stokes vector. Um, if we uh, uh, heat a cloud of dust with a, with a beam of light with a specific uh, stock vectors, the, the light will be changed following this equation on the right hand side. And the, uh, the matrix that changes the vector, the Stokes vector, is called the scattering matrix. Uh, it's the, the mathematical uh, equation that encodes all the information about uh, uh, properties of dust. So this matrix is specific of every kind of dust and uh, is a specific of the physical and chemical properties of the particles. In particular, if we uh, have a unpolarized incident light, uh, the F11 and F12 uh, elements of this matrix are related to the phase function, which is basically the intensity and the degree of linear polarization of the light. And in general, the F22 and the F44 are related to linear depolarization and circular depolarization ratios. So what we do in Colab is measuring is measuring this matrix, and basically what we have is a number of uh, analog uh, dust analogs. We put them through a, an aerosol generator, generate a cloud of uh, um, randomly oriented particles, uh, and then we hit that cloud with a laser. Uh, the laser obviously has its Stokes vector, and the scatter light has uh, uh, the modified Stokes vector, and we detect it with uh, our photomultiply at a specific angle, scattering angle or phase angle in this case. Because it's a, it's, a, it's a cloud of randomly oriented particles, and uh, we assume that they have mirror symmetry, the scattering matrix simplifies vaguely and only has this uh, block uh, diagonal uh, non zero elements. Actually, only six of them are different. And we can determine them by introducing in the, in the setup different combinations of polar, polar, uh, polarizers, both at the source and at the detector. So, by doing different combinations, we can measure all these elements. And then what we do is to do that as a function of uh, scattering angle so that we can build these nice curves of uh, uh, intensity or phase function and the degree of linear polarization. This is actually the simplest combination of optics, uh, only a polarizer and the optical modulator in the, in the opti op optical train. And uh, what we see here is that uh, basically towards a zero scattering angle, so when you are looking uh, forward at the, at this position, you have the uh, diffraction maximum. And uh, the other very uh, characteristic, characteristic element of the polarization curve is that uh, at a specific inversion angle, it becomes negative. That means that the negative polarization is, it means that the polarization vector is uh, parallel to the scattering angle. Okay, so why do we want, to, why do we want to change uh, cold law at all? So the reason is that after the Rosetta mission uh, at 67P, uh, we have realized that there's a huge uh, diversity of, uh, of particle types, uh, morphologies, uh, sizes, etc. And in fact, uh, it has been shown that the uh, measurements uh, from the ground of the polarization phase curve uh, of 67P um, are not consistent with uh, the measurements in situ performed by the Osiris camera at uh, Rosetta. And we realized in the lab that the only way of uh, explaining both things simultaneously is if we have very big particles with very absorbing small inclusions inside. But we were not prepared for that. Actually, we did the measurements with the prop. We put the particle on top of a prop, and then we did the same experiment replacing the aerosol generator I just in share, in share, have shown in the previous slide. With this prop, put it on top of the particle, and then do the experiment. And then we have to, by hand, just changing the orientation so that um, we, are, uh, we can assume that we are in random orientation. But this is calling obviously for a for an upgrade so that the thing can be done more uh, systematically and uh, um, without having to uh, mess around with the sample all the time. And there is another very obvious reason for changing this, and is that we want to preserve scarce valuable samples. So at the moment, uh, what we do is basically 
stuck with a vacuum pump all the aerosol that we generated in the lab so that we don't have everything covered in dust. Um, but uh, by doing that, we are basically lose our sample. Um, uh, samples are very valuable. You know, you know, I mean, samples, even the samples that we prepare in the lab are valuable because sometimes uh, we can synthesize a huge amount of it and it's, it's, uh, it demands a lot of resources to, to synthesize a huge amount of dust that we need for good experiments. Um, and the other reason is we, we may want to use the real stuff instead of, instead of uh, dust analog. So we use the, the real stuff, imagine we just pick a, a cosmic dust sample and just throw it through the vacuum pump. So that's not nice. We want to have uh, the sample preserved after the, after the experiment. So that's why uh, we, we have changed the, the, the setup. The first change we have done is uh, to uh, have the capability of uh, increasing the diameter of the, of the beam by introducing a beam expander. But the problem we had in the lab previously is that we have a very bulky uh, argon krypton laser, which uh, actually had a huge footprint and covered most half of, mostly half of the, of the table. So we need some space there. Therefore, what we did was to up upgrade the laser itself. We bought a, a powerful four diode laser machine uh, connected with fiber optics to a collimator. And then we shoot that over the optical train having now a huge amount of space here, we can put extra optics. And in this case, what we have done additionally was to introduce the beam expander, which as you can see here in animation, expands the beam and make it as big as the new particles that we want to measure. Previously, the beam didn't have to be as big because the particles are in the micron size range. So that's basically what we have done first, place the block A, so the, the so to say, the, 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 the light source by a, a more modern and versatile light source. And the second thing we have done uh, regarding the preservation of samples and the capability of being able to measure these samples is to uh, commission an um, um, acoustic levitator to be able to suspend particles in the middle of the, of the optical train uh, so that they can be recovered, as you can see here in the animation. And uh, also, uh, well, it's uh, as you can see, they are rotating, so we don't need to. Be, we, we don't have to be all the time so changing the orientation. This thing is uh, basically a, a loudspeaker with a reflector, and then you generate a standing wave there. And, and then uh, this uh, setup enables you to suspend a particle in one of the nodes of the of the standing wave. Um, is is something relatively standard, and. Uh, in the last iteration, uh, this work has been done by Angel Colin. Um, we've been able to suspend actually very big uh, and bulky samples. Like, well, these are what is in comparison with the uh, with the point of the of the of the pen, and these are a few millimeters in size, and they, they can be suspended very be suspended very suspended very nicely, levitated very nicely. In fact, we've done some tests with a glass sphere, uh, which is uh, 0.75 mm millimeters in diameter, and the measurements are roughly consistent with the calculations with the MI uh, uh, model, which is exact for spherical particles. <coughs> this uh, small difference may be due to the fact that we still not, are not able to control very well the, the height of the, of the samples. And because in this particular case, we didn't use the, the beam expander. So we probably were measuring only half the sphere or a partial portion of the sphere. But I mean, this is very pro promising results. This is how it looks like, we just put the and levitator in the, middle, in the middle of the setup. Uh, still, we can go back to the previous configuration, obviously. And we have uh, a camera also that allows us to uh, be, uh, make sure that the particles is in the middle of the, of, of the setup. This is the software that has been written in, in the house uh, by uh, uh, people in at UDIT. And this has been a collaboration with uh, Asian Marco from the uh, Universidad Pública in Navarra. This has been funded by a project Leonidas in the previous call from the Ministry of Science. All right, um, and then the second part of the upgrade is uh, the need of new cometary analogs. As we've seen before, uh, I've mentioned before, the uh, Rosetta mission opened a new era on, on understanding of particle shapes, morphologies, etc. So we have now a huge uh, 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 variety of different uh, uh, types of particles. Um, in, at the beginning, it looked very, uh, very uh, wildly, wildly changing, but it has been possible to establish a systematic classification of this by just uh, looking at how uh, uh, monomers and, uh, and, uh, and bigger particles uh, 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 sort of stick together. So we want to do that uh, in the lab as well, to be able to, to, uh, to make measurements in conditions which are similar to 
uh, the, the ones that you find in the particles uh, in, the, in the real life. So we have a collaboration with uh, uh, the Institute for uh, Glass and, and Ceramic, also from SASIC. Uh, we use, uh, in collaboration with, that, with them, advanced dust synthesis methods, uh, which we import from material science. That, that's what, we, that they, what they, did, uh, they do in the Institute. And um, in this case, we are able to, by doing different, by applying different met methods to change the physical properties of the particle systematically. So we can change size, shape, porosity, composition, um, and vary them in a systematic way. And then we have, when we have our samples, we are able to measure the scattering matrix by varying the, the properties of the, of the particles. This, uh, these are different methods. Uh, this is a, a so-called top-down method. Basically, what you, what you do is to grind down uh, to mill um, a, a pieces of minerals to micron sizes. Or you can also use a bottom-up method, which is basically a gas to particle conversion method, where you generate particles by mixing chemicals, both uh, ionic or neutral, with very high dipole moments. And then once you have the particles in the micron size or the nanometric size um, range, then you can start uh, agglomerating them using different techniques. And then you get uh, micron size agglomerates. And then you can go a step further. And using consolidation techniques, you can get millimeter size aggregates, which are the ones that we assume is, are, are present in, in uh, 67P and were not detected before. And uh, this is complemented with a number of uh, uh, ancillary techniques. We do laser scattering particle size sizing for determining the, the size distributions. Optical microscopy also to determine size distributions. We do uh, a scanning electron microscopy or transmission electron uh, microscopy. We do energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy to determine the composition. And we also do diffuse reflectant, reflectant spectroscopy measurements. Uh, and we have now this facility at IAA to determine the mineralogy. Um, besides that, we do electromagnetic scattering modeling. We have the in-house capability for doing DDA calculations. And then now with uh, uh, Julia Martikainen, who is a postdoc in our group, we can do ray tracing modeling. And we also can use a computational database of the databases of pre-computed scattering data to fit our uh, observations. Right, so after uh, giving you the update on the upgrades, I will tell you uh, a bit about what we do in the lab uh, on a research point of view. So basically, as you've seen, uh, my First uh, objective will be to disentangle the effect of size, structure, and composition on uh, scattered light. Um, and then we use that understanding to interpret in situ and remote photopolarimetric observations. And these observations relate to cometary dust, tails, and the zodiacal dust, uh, grain sizes in protoplanetary MDB disks, uh, asteroidal surfaces. Uh, and we also study specific phenomena, as for, as for example, how will the um, uh, space weathering change the scattering properties of the surface of a, a meteorite, uh, sorry, an asteroid, or how the carbonaceous component of cometary dust changes as a function of uh, age or uh, proximity to, to the sun. And all this is supported by observations and dynamical modeling. Okay, so um, this will be more or less the observing geometry of uh, of, uh, of a comet, this is 67P. Uh, in this case, we had like two sets of observations. Uh, Rosetta was uh, in situ, and there were also uh, more or less contemporary uh, remote observations. And then uh, the question is, what what is what is uh, what class, what polarimetric class is this comet? So um, there is uh, allegedly uh, there are allegedly two kinds of comets. One is the dust bridge, and the other one is the gas bridge. The dust bridge. Uh, allegedly uh, contains small particles, and the dust ridge, uh, the, the, the dust ridge con contains big, uh, small particles, and the gas ridge large particles. Okay, the dust ridge uh, has a large polarization curve, so high polarization, and uh, the opposite for the for the gas ridge. And then it is believed that the, the dust ridge uh, classification or class or the alleged class is uh, the one to which uh, uh, 67P belongs uh, because uh, of, the, of the polarization curve, uh, which is relatively high, 20% and 90 degrees. Um, so uh, what, what, uh, when uh, the problem is that we, don't, we, we need usually to, to reproduce different uh, observations. In this case, we are not telling anything about the phase function. And then when uh, Rosetta went to, uh, to 67P and measured uh, the, the phase function, we realized that the, that phase function was not consistent with uh, uh, 
uh, small particles, therefore, therefore uh, 67p uh, is not uh, uh, dust rich. Well, all this is obviously uh, a discussion which uh, is st still to be completed. But the fact is that uh, we could, by uh, measuring our porous large particle with, uh, with uh, assorted inclusions, we could explain both things. But now the question is uh, if, uh, if uh, Rosetta is, uh, sorry, 67 piece dust rich, then uh, the explanation about the small particles falls apart. Um, well, uh, the fact is that we are now uh, luckily having a, comet in, uh, a, a, a new comet mission, comet interceptor, which is going to be sent to a comet, which is allegedly a, a dust rich comet, because it will be a, a pristine or a long period comet. And then we will get more information about what's going on there. And, and, and then in this mission, we have the capability of measuring simultaneously both the phase function and the degree of linear polarization, which is very important. We, we often will forget that it's not sufficient, it's not enough with uh, uh, reproducing one specific observation. We need to, expect to explain several observations to constrain better our inference. So in preparation for this mission, we are also uh, uh, measuring uh, new, new types of uh, cosmic dust analogs to see what is, uh, what is going on here. Um, we also have uh, uh, performed some research on uh, protoplanetary and debris disks. Um, this will be more or less the, the geometry of observation. There are very nice observations now of uh, debris disks thanks to advances in coronography, adaptive optics, and also thanks to the Hubble Space Telescope. And the observations uh, of polarization more or less uh, show that particles of this uh, uh, structure, very high porosity, and being made out of silicates will kind of uh, reproduce a very high uh, polarization of uh, 90 degrees. The problem with this is that you, when you do an analysis of these observations, you cannot usually just, uh, just go and say, well, I will model the, the particles with uh, this geometry. It's, this is not, you cannot model this very easily. Uh, you need a huge amount of computation time uh, so it's in, it's in practice, it's, it's easier to use uh, these uh, simplified geometries. In this case, it's a, it's a hollow sphere. You can use spheres, you can use uh, ellipsoids. There are a number of, uh, of uh, um, models out there that can help you to, to do easier modeling of things. The problem is that simple modeling usually doesn't give you the right answer. Um, in this case, if you use the hollow sphere method, for, in, for feeding simultaneously the phase function and the degree of linear polarization of, of this disk, you get, uh, if you feed the F11, you get particles which are larger than 25 microns. If you feed the de degree of linear polarization, you get particles that are larger than two microns. So there's uh, one order of magnitude difference there. And also in either case, the indices, of the, the, indices uh, the refraction indices that you get are not uh, realistic. Uh, in fact, we've done this in the lab. Uh, we measure the curves of uh, polarization and, and, and phase function curves of phosphorite. We have calculated the mean uh, uh, model, the mean, the mean curves for spherical particles with the same optical parameters. You see that they have nothing to do with, you have mostly negative polarization in the case of spheres. If you try to fit um, the calculations to the observations, uh, by using a, mean, a least squares or whatever method you want to use, uh, leaving three parameters, for example, the uh, absorbance or uh, the minimum size in the distribution, you get completely different results. So actually you get uh, five order magnitude difference in, in, uh, in absorbance and um, you get uh, also a, almost three orders magnitude difference in the smallest particles that you have in the, in the size distribution. So at the moment, what you're doing is trying to encourage uh, observers and models to use uh, lab data. And actually, uh, my colleague Olga is now uh, doing that with uh, uh, our collaborators in the uh, Grenoble and, and Virginia University. We also do some uh, asteroidal surfaces. Uh, in this case, uh, there's, there's a very, very interesting problem um, related to the barbarian asteroids, uh, which have a very peculiar polarization curve. Uh, Peculiar means that uh, the inversion angle, uh, so when you go from positive to negative polarization, is, uh, is very high compared with the majority of asteroids. Uh, and the other thing is that it, it looks like the, uh, the phase uh, curve of the polarization goes all the way down, 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 doesn't show a minimum. Uh, this is also very different from the majority of comets. Um, this, 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 this family of comets is uh, um, 
also having a special spectroscopy characteristics and showing a abundant spin spinel. A spinel is a component of uh, calcium aluminium inclusions, which are which, which I believe to be the uh, oldest materials in the solar system. So uh, there is a, a lot of uh, speculation that this family of asteroids may come from the disruption of, of a very, very old object. So uh, when you look at polar, uh, polarization, uh, as I said, you see a very, very strange uh, behavior. So what we have done is to go and take an espinel, which is the prominent peak that appears in the spectroscopy and see if the polarization is due, it is due to that component. And actually what you see is that when you took a large uh, espinel pebble, a, a crystal actually of a few millimeters in diameter in, in, in radius, you see a very similar uh, a very similar polarimetric behavior as opposed to the polarimetric behavior that you see with, this, with the powder. So we have the powder as espinel. It has a similar inversion angle, but it has a very, very, very well-defined minimum and it goes up to zero towards a zero phase angle. And the problem is that we have identified like, like hundreds of possible explanations beyond, uh, beyond chemi chemistry to explain this. For example, we know that this behavior will be characteristic of crystals when you have uh, large uh, crystals and they are faceted and then you have retro reflection inside them. So there will be an explanation for, a, for this kind of behavior. So at the moment we are trying to uh, investigate if this is a chemical or a, simply a geometrical effect. Um, and now, uh, leaving uh, minor bodies behind, uh, I will give a few examples of what we do in the lab regarding atmospheric science. We are involved in a, in a consortium grant, uh, European consortium, consortium grant called Roma. Um, and what we do here is to characterize Martian analogs to, in order to obtain a better representation of the scattering properties of Martian dust by measuring the refractive indices and by, by measuring the scattering matrix with the objective of uh, getting a better understanding of radiative transfer in the Martian atmosphere and getting better parameters for retrieval of uh, aerosols from uh, the observations. So what we have done is to take uh, all the Martian analogs, analogs available in the market, because this is actually a market they are, they are sold. Uh, and then they've, seen, they've been sent to the Institute of uh, Glass and Ceramics to uh, select uh, them uh, in, in different size distributions. They have uh, fantastic capabilities for doing that. And actually the size distribution that we get here and that the ones we use in the lab are unprecedented in our field in the, in the sense that they are extremely narrow. So that, I mean, you cannot consider them as uh, monodispersed, but they are very, very narrow. That gives you the opportunity of at least understand uh, what is the effect of size if you have very different no overlapping distributions and you do the measurements of the scattering properties. In this case, what we use the large particles is these are the largest particles. These are not representative of Martian dust. Martian dust will be uh, around there and below. But these ones are very nice in the sense that you can measure reflectance spectra. You can compute the uh, scattering uh, characteristics inside the dust using a ray tracing optics method. Uh, which is uh, being applied by, by Julia. And from this, you can retrieve the, uh, the, optical, uh, the optical constants, in particular, the, the absorption index. And what we have found with the, our analogs is that uh, they have a, uh, the absorptions, which are much lower than the one that has been commonly assumed in all uh, Martian studies. And in, in fact, we've taken spectra from the Martian surface. Uh, we, we have reproduced them using the same code and using these uh, new uh, optical indices. And we find that we are able to reproduce the observations very nicely, whereas if you use the old uh, absorption indices, the result is uh, terrible. So this is some uh, encouraging news for us. For the small sizes, we are planning to measure uh, the scattering matrix. This is the scattering matrix of the larger sample. But we also have uh, we also have a, a sample center around one micron and one center about 0.1 microns. These are the ones that are actually relevant for for Mars. And uh, our plan is to measure the scattering matrices and use them for uh, giving them to the modelers and to, to, to the people who work in retrieval to do a better better job in, in retrievals. And Julia is also doing some modeling of these uh, particles and. Uh, Actually, the, 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 the excitable particles, so you, there is a, a database of scattering properties of these excitable particles. You use them to combine them uh, and uh, calculate a, a 
scattering matrix, and then you uh, reproduce very nicely the observations. So this, this actually, the, the objective of this is giving a, a, an opportunity to parameterize better the, the aerosols in the Martian atmosphere. Okay, and uh, finally, Earth. Uh, here our idea is to provide data for uh, radiative transfer modeling. Uh, and, and what I'm going to present in this presentation is uh, our results on sun and dust and cirrus clouds, although this is preliminary work. And um, we also want to find methods to distinguish between different types of aerosols. So we try to find differences between mineral, mineral dust and bioaerosols, but we also want to identify you know, different bioaerosols, for example, different types of, of pollen. Regarding uh, dust, we have had this year a uh, very long uh, season of uh, dust intrusions. The, the biggest one came in, in March. Um, we collected some dust in, in Guadix after the rain. And uh, unfortunately, the only station of the aerosol robotic network that was able to measure the event was uh, here on the top in, in Galicia. But we still have been able to compare the results that we have uh, obtained in the lab with the samples we took from from the roof of a, of, a, of a house and the measurements of, uh, of, uh, of, the, of the robotic network. And actually, uh, if, you go, if you see the red and the black curve are very similar compared to the previous day measurement, which uh, indicates uh, um, C aerosol and is actually characteristic of uh, water droplets. And uh, the size distribution that we measure in the lab and the one that have been, has been retrieved from Aeronet is uh, very nicely in agreement. So, we are confident that uh, our, our lab study can uh, validate uh, these retrievals, which are made actually with uh, spheroid particles. The other thing which is quite remarkable here is that we have done measurements from different samples of dust. We did uh, measurements with a sample from 2004. We've done measurements with the sample taken this year. And we also have uh, samples from the Agobi uh, Desert Intrusion Event in Beijing, and they look pretty similar, uh, except for the event this year, which is slightly darker and therefore produces a higher polarization. But besides that, the differences are so small that you could even average them and use a, uh, a single average uh, scattering matrix for all the desert that's, that's that you have on Earth. And um, actually, you can use those to plug them into uh, radiative transfer codes to uh, calculate how much uh, radiative forcing introduces an event like this. This is uh, ice. Uh, zero clouds are basically very high line I, uh, ice clouds. They can be very extensive. They actually cover 25% of the of their surface. Uh, and this, this, this picture is actually related to the dust event. They form when you have a huge amount of uh, condensation nuclei at very high altitude, and then you have a sudden uh, injection of uh, dry, uh, hot air in the upper atmosphere, on the middle atmosphere in this case. And then you have you can have a very very extensive coverage in this case because there was an atmospheric river uh, carrying dust to, to, the, to the center and north of Europe. This, these ice uh, particles have been measured in air, by aircraft uh, collection measurements, um, and we will be interested in knowing how is the uh, radiative force in, introduced by such an event. But uh, the problem is that it's very difficult to work with water ice in the lab. So, uh, as an alternative, what we can do is use laboratory analogs. Uh, uh, sodium fluorosilicate fluoros is, is an analog that crystallizes uh, similarly. It forms these nice columns which uh, agglomerate forming rosettes. Uh, our colleagues in M M uh, IMK and KIT are producing these analogs. Uh, we have them already in the lab, and by suspending them in the, um, in, in the um, levitator, we will be able to determine the scattering properties. And this is the other aspect. Um, of uh, aerosol measure measurements. We can measure the, the scattering matrices of uh, mineral dust, and we can measure also the uh, scattering matrices of, that, of, of pollen. We just go and collect pollen from a tree um, and, and measure it through the, through the aerosol generator. And then you see that the curves are very different. The, for example, the polarization curve of uh, Cypress uh, uh, pollen is very different from the one from mineral dust. Still, mineral dust has some differences so um, in this case, uh, sarin dust and uh, volcanic ashes are very different in this, in this element. So the, the summary of this is you can measure three uh, scattering matrix elements at three different angles. You use uh, a clustering analysis method or any other machine learning method, and then you're able to distinguish between the three types of aerosol. We've done the same with uh, the whole 
set of uh, measurements uh, that are contained in the Granada Amsterdam studying database. And you are able to very nicely classify the different uh, samples that are in this database. For example, uh, clays are classified nicely together. The uh, lunar analogs are also classified together. Cypress pollen is obviously in a single class and so on. So this is a very promising tool and could be used in, in, in uh, um, instruments that measure aerosol in situ. In a similar, uh, the similar in the same in the same direction of research, we have measured the scattering uh, matrix of different pollen samples. They have very different uh, scattering elements, and this is because they have, as you can see, very different shapes and, 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 and surface structures. This will be a, a brief on the top of the of the oleo pollen. This one has small spheres on top. Uh, this is the Mickey Mouse. Uh, pollen, grain, pinus, they have very different uh, scattering behavior. So in principle, if you do the same as we have done in the previous study, you could also be able to distinguish them. The only problem with this is that you, is before doing um, this uh, analysis, you need to, be, to make sure that uh, um, there is enough contrast in the observations against the polarization of the sky. What we want to do is to use the, the scattering matrix uh, of pollen to uh, with a, in combination with a uh, instrument that already exists in a, as a prototype. This, a prototype. this is a, um, a smartphone, and then you put a, a polarimetric uh, device uh, on the camera, and then you're able to measure the aerosol loading on the atmosphere. If we were able to teach this uh, instrument how to distinguish between different pollen taxa, then you will know the type of pollen, the concentration, and then you will be able to have a, some kind of alert uh, idea if you are suffering from allergy. From allergy. Uh, but as I say, uh, before we are doing a, um, a feasibility study to see if there is a pol enough pol polarimetric contrast between the polarization of the sky and this, and this behavior. And finally, I come to the scattering uh, database. This has been also updated recently uh, with a new, uh, a new look. And uh, basically, what we have here is an um, an online tool for downloading uh, scattering matrices and the accompanying uh, scanning electron microscopy images, which tell you about the structure and the size distribution, which tells you about the size. Um, this also accompanied by uh, the sample context and the optical constants. And to conclude the presentation, uh, I will go through two different, very recent developments. We've been working on how to apply our uh, methods to um, to diagnostic uh, of uh, illnesses or even to uh, public health uh, problems. In this case, uh, we used uh, the setup to see we were able to detect by polarimetric methods um, infected uh, um, droplets of uh, saliva with uh, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, what we did here in the in, in the cold lab was to do the feasibility, the, the, the proof of concept study by. Uh, Using our setup and placing in the middle of the setup where now is the already data, um, uh, a piece of Teflon with different samples of infected and non infected uh, saliva. It's actually uh, not real stuff, it's uh, uh, simulated. So it's simulated saliva and these are proxies for, for, for the SARS virus. Where they, 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 they are not the real stuff and they are not uh, um, contagious. So we did the, the, the proof of concept here. We found, we found what, what, what was the, the, the angle of maximum polarization. And then with a dedicated device using a polarimetric camera and using like seven or, seven or nine different polarimetric uh, uh, indicators, descriptors, they were able to tell which particles were um, infected and which ones were not. This uh, use in combination with uh, spectros spectroscopy methods, which can also be applied simultaneously, uh, is giving a very high uh, um, uh, skill capability of uh, detecting infection. Uh, this is also work in progress. And finally, uh, the other aspect that we are touching here is uh, see if we can detect uh, illnesses in, in blood cells. Uh, uh, red blood cells normally look like uh, like this. They are biconcave, uh, like a donut, but uh, there is a anemia Ill illness called uh, sickle cell anemia, which uh, in which the, 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 the red blood cells are deformed in this in this shape. 
And there's another one called spherocytosis where they acquire like a spherical shape. So obviously, if these particles, which are on the uh, wavelength range, on the visible wavelength range size, um, scatter light, uh, they will scatter very, different, very differently. They have different shapes. So if we are able to measure uh, a droplet of blood with contaminated, uh, well, contaminated or so with ill uh, or ill uh, red blood uh, cells, that we really should be able to detect them. Uh, this is another application of the sonic levitation, which you can put a droplet in the middle. Um, and then try to measure what is inside. In this, we are collaborating with, uh, with several uh, public health institutions, and this is a, a, a funded project by the Junta de Andalucía. Um, uh, this, uh, this is the end of my presentation. There was a very nice video here, but uh, we have some technical problems today, and we cannot uh, see it, but that's all for me. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Juan Carlos. <clears throat> so now the talk is open for uh, questions. Please, uh, <clears throat> the Zoom participants, raise your hand. And uh, in at the Salon de Actos, also, uh, you can, also, uh, Juan Carlos, you can manage the questions, please. Thank you for this very nice today. Can you approach to the micro, please? I have a, a comment. <clears throat> Actually, this comment I had made 10 years ago with Fernando. Um, we had uh, enhanced radiative transfer models to simulate the spectral energy distribution as well as the images, uh, my images of protoplanetary bees and their uh, disease. Also, we had a plenty of observation for this target. And we had a very detailed model uh, assuming gradient of temperature and density, but we assume uh, spherical particles for our opacity. It would be great to consider different shapes, different shapes and different mm -hmm. kinds of uh, mineral mineralogy or porosity to see how change the synthetic images and to vary in this parameters. Yeah. No? I, I guess it would be very interesting for yeah. us. Well, we should be talking more often. Yeah. Yes. It was on the I have a kind of technical question, well, not, not really technical, but uh, you mentioned that you measure four different wavelengths. Yeah. Uh, do you think it would be feasible so, so how to extend those measurements into, well, into the UV or into any other infrared? I'm, I'm thinking on Mars observations, where many of the observations are done either in the near infrared or in, mm -hmm. the, in the UV. Yeah, in principle, it's technically possible. Uh, but uh, measuring inf infrared measurements is very tricky in terms of the detectors that you need. Uh, and uh, in the UV, uh, the, pro the main, major problem you will have in the UV is, the, is the, you need special optics for that. But in principle, it's, uh, it's feasible. So now, now we, are, we are measuring from 405 to uh, 640 or something like that. But it could be extended beyond into the UV and, and into the infrared. Hello, operators. It's very nice to talk. Um, one uh, curiosity I have, you mentioned about something about the COVID. How, I mean, I understand that the viruses are really very small. So yeah. how, how can you handle that? Yeah, it's a very good question. In reality, we are not measuring, we are not measuring the virus as such, because the virus is nan nanometric. But the virus creates a, or makes the saliva crystallize in a, in a very special way. So you, you get like micro-sized crystals, which are a, a characteristic of the, of the virus that you have there. So it's like a, it's like an inference. It's not, it's not like a direct detection of the virus. You are inferring the virus because it makes the saliva or a droplet in, you, in which you suspend the virus crystallize in a specific way. And it seems to be a specific of, of that particular virus because we have cross check with other viruses and they don't crystallize in the same, in the same way. So that seems to be the, the reason. Okay. Good, thank you. Um, I have a further comment or question. Ah, I've seen there's a very large variety of, of the different uh, 
particles and scenarios, etc. But having heard anything about Cunningham, which from a point of view about the aerosols are really very mm -hmm. interesting. And particularly you mentioned there, well, I think it'd be a collaboration with the Instituto de Material, where you actually see that I have to some kind of reaction between ions and how they actually you can build up different aerosol types. And that's really yeah, what I mean, we think is happening in the I didn't want to get time. into that. I didn't want to get into that. Although that's like my second line of research. I mean, I do gas to particle conversion and uh, photo photochemical gas to particle conversion, which is ha what happened in, in Titan and Mesosphere. Right. Um, uh, I didn't want to get into that because it's, it will be it will make the, the talk like much bigger. But yeah, we are interested into that as well. In fact, we we, we have we have analogs from from different uh, teams that produce uh, uh, analogs uh, in. Uh, in simulation chambers where they discharge uh, uh, radio frequency on a, on a gas uh, with methane and uh, nitrogen and then they see the evolution of the particles and then we got samples from them and we have measured them in the lab as well mm. uh, i haven't got i didn't get into that because it's, it's a messy it's a messy thing uh, probably in, in titan the, the particles are much smaller than when you create them in a in a in a simulator and when you pack them in an aluminum foil and send them to a lab to do the measurements. Oh. So what we get are very, very large aggregates and they are very difficult to disentangle and sort of get back into the monomer size. So that's why we struggle to interpret those measurements. But they, in principle, we are also interested in that and we also do that. Okay, good, I didn't know that, thank you. Thank Are there questions in Zoom? No questions at Zoom. Okay. So I think we can thank uh, Juan Carlos again just for the, thank the seminar. Thank you very much, Juan Carlos, for being in this talk.